Thank you. And thank you, students and faculty at Southwestern. Thank you, Dr. Dockery. What a dear friend he's been through the years. He mentioned his parents in my church at First Baptist Tuscaloosa. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he had to have his parents in mind. They were just great people, wonderful people. In fact, I wish the Lord had cloned them and uh, spread them out a good bit in the congregation. Not that everybody was bad, but they didn't always have that good of a spirit and a more, what I would say, magnanimous and forgiving spirit for some young pastor coming along at that particular time. <clears throat> I'm glad to be back on campus. I was here August of 2016. I remember it real well. I remember the hospitality then as I do now, and I'm very glad to be with you. <clears throat> Dr. Richard Land, we're glad he's here. I'm saying he's here all week, and he is one of the premier leaders in SBC life, and I certainly have grown to appreciate him through the years as many of you as well. I want you to know, even though I'm from a, if you will, a rival seminary, even though we don't use that term, a, a family seminary, a different brother or sister in the family of seminaries, I've always respected Southwestern, deeply respected Southwestern. And I love my seminary, but I've always had this respect. And this second visit is a one of endearment for me. I've been to all six seminaries. Every single one of them has its unique contribution in Baptist life. But you are strategically located in a part, you know this, but in a part of the U.S., but in Baptist land, if you will, that you are in many ways the, the magnet for students to come from all over the world and, yea, all over the Southwest and Southeast and other parts of the U.S. So thank you for being a part of the Southwestern family. And although these lights are in my eyes, is that Steve Lempke right over there? Yes, indeed. All right, Steve, good to see you, your dear wife. I uh, want to tell you, yesterday I was picked up at the airport by one of your students, Moses Wilson, who comes from the very beautiful nation of India, and he was telling me he was getting married. And we, Spencer Bell, who's with me, one of your predominantly online students, we were congratulating him. And then last night, by chance, Matt Queen connected us with one of his blessed children, a PhD in evangelism, and his name is Ben Sutton, and he was telling us he's getting married. So last night, Yesterday and last night, I spent my time doing premarital counseling with two <laughs> students who were getting ready to get married, and I'm, I'm proud for them. Uh, the journey ahead will be good, and it also will have bumps in the road, as life itself does. Life can be messy, but I think great potential are in both of those young men, as I see in you as well. This morning, I'd like to just share a little personal thought with you that related to uh, maybe the juncture I am in life, we all live in chapters in our lives and ministries. But recently, I was called upon to do what we do in our, my role as executive director. We often convene leadership groups. And one of them was of my colleagues, and I was to host it, and which meant my staff had to host it. And they had to do the work, and I did what I do. And I came up with a title. I'm not creative at all, but I came up, I woke up real early one morning and thinking about the theme for the meeting, difference makers, making it one word. And being a loyal Alabamian, one word is red, red and white for Alabama, and the other part of the, the other word put together is blue for orange and blue at Auburn. I tried to balance that as best I could. Nobody knew anything more about that than those of us who are Alabama fans or Auburn fans. So Difference Makers was the theme, and I, I started germinating in my mind what that really means at this point in our culture, at this point where we are in the strategic time, in the formidable, formidable years in which you're getting ready, doing ministry, but getting ready for ministry. You have long runway, Lord willing, ahead of you. And I began to think about some people in the Bible who really made a difference. Now, we could go all day long. We could be here for a long time talking about difference makers in the Bible. But I, was gra I gravitated toward one verse, Acts 4, 13. 
And that verse reads, and they saw their boldness, talking about Peter and John, we'll set the table in a moment, but they saw their boldness and they perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men. A lot of synonyms can be used there. They saw their boldness, perceived they were untrained and uneducated. They marveled because they realized they had been with Jesus. Let's set the table here of what happens because there's always a, something before and something after. The book of Acts gives us really the story of the growth of the early church from the beginning to the end of the 28 chapters. It's a saga that continues. Not perfect at all. In fact, it had a lot of bumps in the road. But at the end, the scripture tells us in the last part of chapter 28, and the gospel was unhindered, an unhindered gospel, which could be the story of the book of Acts. It starts out, of course, Luke, one who wrote the gospel of Luke, he was a physician, he was a historian, something of a theologian. And of course, after the book of Luke, he gives us what we call the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. Writing to a person we don't know, not identified in Scripture, may have been a pseudonym, but Theopolis, meaning lover of God. But in that one power-packed chapter, chapter 1, obviously the key verse, maybe the theme of all the book of Acts and beyond, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, at that particular time, they didn't have a whole lot of globes. They didn't have Google Maps, and they didn't know what all that meant. And for Jesus to tell them with the Great Commission, now you go be my disciples, make disciples of people around the world, well, all they could think about is they had just walked a little bit around Jerusalem and beyond, and for them to be considered the ones who will initiate the movement of the gospel, humanly speaking, was just incomprehensible, unfathomable. So there they are, you'll receive power, and then they had to kind of wait for that moment in the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's full revelation coming upon them, and they realized that they had Christ himself through the power of his Holy Spirit infused in them, which was answering a question for them. When Jesus ascended after his death, burial, and resurrection, they were asking, well, what now? What, what's the next step? Well, they got the next step. They were infused with the power of Christ's presence, God's power in their lives. And they were then challenged to be difference makers in the lives of others. Well, what happens in Pentecost? Do you have this man by the name of Simon Peter who at one time said, not once, not twice, but three times he denied our Lord. Of course, he said he would never let that happen. Oh, that would be totally embarrassment. But he was, uh, I would just say he was a typical Baptist. He put his foot in his mouth pretty quickly. Simon Peter seemed to be the kind of guy that, like me, for instance, that doesn't like silence. If you're around someone, there needs to be conversation. And when Jesus would say something and there'd be silence, Simon Peter would just speak up and say something. And because of that... He overcommitted and overpromised, undercommitted in terms of under delivery. Well, at the end of Acts chapter 2, the, the whole what we call Pentecost experience, almost indescribable for us today, and the explosion of the church began. And then all of a sudden, almost like a lull in chapter 3. There are no house churches or anything of this nature. So Peter and John are still tethered to the temple, so to speak. And they're walking by in the entrance to the temple, and they see this lame man, lame from his mother's womb, as the old King James used to talk about. Now, I want to tell you, I want to hypothesize just a moment. I don't believe that's the first time they saw this man. But I do believe it's the first time they really saw this man. Up until that point, he'd been like a piece of furniture. They may have passed by him asking alms. They didn't have particularly any money. 
They, have the, they, they represent the entirety of what we call invisible people in various walks of life. We see them, but we don't see them. But on this day, with the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit, they seized the moment. And what happened in that part of Acts chapter 3, I've always loved. He looked at them expecting to receive something from them, obviously alms. Peter says, well, now, I don't have any silver or gold. I don't have any money. But I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And interestingly, he reached out his right hand to help the man get up. More than just proclamation, you could say, there was a bit of Visible, tangible discipleship going on. He's going to help him get on his feet. And by the way, he, the right hand was a symbol of, of all kinds of power. It was the right hand, often described as the one of power. Now, for those of you left-handed, don't worry about it because now we know power is in both hands. You're very thankfully created to have both and have them all your life. And if you're left-handed, I'll tell you, I was born to be left-handed. But in that particular day, my day, it was a stigma that's now thankfully gone, and I was made into a right-handed person, and that ruined my personality. I don't know what's happened to you, but that just totally ruined me. You could say I'm ambidextrous or non-dextrous, whatever. Right hand lifts him up. What does this man do? Now, he's never walked. His feet and ankle bones received strength, and he began walking and leaping and praising God, and all of a sudden, he started to run into the temple. Now, in the temple, you've got to imagine staid and stoic people who have had that kind of attitude and action in worship all their lives. They're not used to someone coming in, walking, leaping, and praising God, especially someone who's never walked, leaped, or praised God. Now, I would really like to, if I could get in a time tunnel, there are many places I, in the ministry of Jesus and the book of Acts as well as in the Paul's journeys, I would like to go to just to see how that happened. But I'd love to see the faces on those people, the looks on their faces. Well, from that, they get into trouble. And the religious leaders find out about it. Well, exhibit A, there's been a miracle here. What are they going to do with a miracle like that? I mean, you can't just turn away and say, that didn't happen. Because they knew him. They'd seen him. He'd been there, fixture, like a piece of furniture at the gate, right before going into the temple. So they did what all religious leaders of self-aggrandizement and egocentricity do. They convene what you might call a tribunal to, to direct these two, Peter and John, hear their story, direct them, not to preach in Jesus' name. But first they said in verse 7 of Acts chapter 4, they said, by what power? Now remember what happened in Acts 1.8? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. By what power and by in whose name did you do this? We remember what Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Well, what those guys, what the religious leaders did, they walked right in, they opened a door for Peter to speak the truth about the gospel. You crucified him. It was in the name of Jesus, and you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. Therefore, there is in no other name that you could have salvation, no other name whatsoever than Jesus Christ. And then now we're at our text. I asked myself, what are some characteristics of difference makers? We could go on and on and list them, like, almost like a leadership seminar, and heaven forbid that we have another one of those necessarily. But let me just give you quick three observations. Right out of Scripture, they saw, they saw their... Boldness. Now, we have to capture that in, in context. The same Simon Peter who had denied Jesus three times was now called bold. 
And he exhibited courage and boldness. They saw their boldness, and they're not accustomed to having people exemplify boldness standing before them. After all, they are the religious leaders, and, and they are ones who have a lot of authority and a lot of influence, and they weren't expecting that, so they just saw their boldness. And by that, I don't mean their foolishness. Some people get boldness and foolishness all mixed up. No, this is a holy boldness. It's a boldness that only can come from God. The kind of boldness that will transform one's life and be instrumental through the power of the Holy Spirit in transforming the lives of other people. There will be in the culture in which we live, we're on the front end of a moral revolution. There will be times, not foolishness, but boldness, not unkindness, but boldness, where you will have to make a stand that is not very popular. But in the name of truth, speak the truth in love and stand where you're supposed to stand on God's word, his revealed truth, and never waver. That's godly, holy boldness. Let me give you a quick illustration. We in Alabama love the story of Martha Myers. 20 years ago, this next December, December 26, 2002, Martha was serving there in Yemen, doctor at Jibla Hospital, and she had some other colleagues, and, and you have to think about this for a moment. In that part of the world, uh, the women didn't go to male doctors. So she was performing an indescribably irreplaceable ministry, and she'd put her backpack on with her, almost like an ENT, and go up mountains in the remote villages, and she'd do that in the name of Jesus everywhere she went. And she was told that many times about her life being threatened and it didn't seem to bother her. On a furlough back home, she told her parents, now look, I've gotten these threats and, and I, I can't live in fear. I just want you to know it's not going to cause me to pause or to retreat. I'm going forward. Now that's the kind of boldness that she had. Well, on that eventful day, where a man came in with an automatic weapon and killed a number of people, primarily her and at least two colleagues, and would have gotten another one had he not been stuck in traffic. That man's wife was one of her, was one of her patients. And he had in his mind that he, she was intentionally trying to proselytize her. Well, he may not have been wrong, but he took her life, a better way of saying it, she gave her life for what she stood for. And when she had her burial, and she's buried not back in Alabama, but on the hillside there in Jibla, when they had her funeral, women lined the streets saying, Sister Martha, Sister Martha, oh, how we love you. That's boldness. Second characteristic, they perceived what I call their weakness. They saw their boldness, they perceived their weakness. Now, what was their weakness? It was obvious to them that they were not a very cultured, not very sophisticated. And, and they thought to themselves, now, when I was in rabbinical school, I don't remember sitting beside this fellow Peter and this other guy, John. I don't remember them there at all. That's being sarcastic. And they knew that they were not educated, not trained. In fact, the literacy was not even good. These were fishermen, for goodness sakes. Nothing wrong with being fishermen, but they represent what was then would be known as the working class, and rightly so. Nothing wrong with it. It keeps the world going, even today. They didn't expect boldness. They didn't expect courage. They didn't accept, expect this kind of exhibition of character from these two ragtag disciples of a dead Messiah. So they perceived their weakness and they, they hit it on the head. They were not educated people. I, I retreat to my growing up years. When I was about 10, 12 years of age, I, I grew up in a working class community as well, so I identify with them pretty well. 
and a working class community with a working class church. It was an old storefront to begin with before we got us a good, nice looking building to worship in. Well, that class, we had one fellow that was the biggest troublemaker I believe God ever made, at least for that age. And he kept everything in chaos, and others kind of joined in. I, I tried my best not to, but next thing you know, you're kind of going along to get along. We would go through one Sunday school teacher after another, and then just one in, one out, just kept on in a, a long line of people who just couldn't put up with us. Until one day, walking into our class was a state trooper in uniform. And he sat down, introduced himself, and I've never seen him. He pulled off his weapon and put it on a chair, empty chair beside him. And he surveyed us as we were checking him out. And he said, now, boys, are we going to have any trouble at all? And in unison almost, we said, no, sir, we're good. Now, he didn't get to stay long. He had to be transferred. The next teacher was a difference maker. He'd come in and sit down and recite the scripture from heart. He would recite the curriculum. He connected with us. He applied it to us. And what is more amazing, it was years later when I discovered that he was semi-illiterate. He was functionally illiterate. On Saturday, his wife would carve out hours. They would together. She would read the scripture that he had it here. He had this auditory, photogenic memory. He had an auditory memory. And the same way with the curriculum. And looking back, I was just utterly amazed at a man like it. But here's the truth. God used his weakness. Now, you're educated people here. We all are to an extent in terms of academics. But there's a whole lot. I don't know about a lot of things, to be honest with you. I'm so one-dimensional. But every single one of us has a weakness. But I'm here to tell you, God can use that weakness if you turn it over to him. Don't let the weakness define you. Don't run from it. Embrace it. Turn it over to him. And let him, in his own way, in a way in which only he can do, let him use it to his glory. They saw their boldness, they perceived their weakness, and then they realized their uniqueness. Now think about this for a moment. Maybe perhaps one of the finest compliments someone can be is being around them, and then you can just say, they've been with Jesus. Uh, Now, Realistically, th- these religious leaders ascertained they had really been with Jesus. They were talking about physically. They were there when he taught his parables. They were there when he performed his miracles. They were there when he healed the sick. They had been with Jesus. But let's extrapolate that and put it in our context. People know when you have been with Jesus. They know it. You don't have to put a billboard on your face. You don't have to have a plasma screen on your face. They know it. They can tell when they're around you. I can listen to people, the way they talk in, in a commercial way, going through a Walmart or whatever. I can listen to them, and I almost can detect whether or not they're a believer. And in fact, I've just said, they'll use a word that I think Christians use, like have a blessed day. And I'll say, well, thank you. I'm a believer. And then we can begin talking. You could tell they've been with Jesus. Now, that's the main, arguably, the main characteristic you take with you in whatever ministry you have, that you've been with Jesus. And he is the ultimate consummate, perfect difference maker. Uh, Listen, I don't get asked, I told you I'm one-dimensional, I don't get asked to do a lot of men's conferences. I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't play golf, I don't skydive from airplanes, I don't ride a motorcycle, 
And I never killed a wild boar with a pocket knife. So I just don't get asked to many men's conferences. Consequently, I do a lot of women's conferences. But seriously, on one occasion I was asked to do a men's conference. I've done a few of them. And I, I can't even remember what I said. It was at our retreat center. And I don't even recall what I talked about. It was probably not worth remembering. If I can't remember, why everybody else would. And I don't really remember what the other guy talked about except one thing, his closing illustration. That when I think about difference makers, I think about this story. A friend was at a, another men's conference and a guy walked up to him and he looked kind of rough and tough. And he said, uh, Preacher, do you want to know my story? <laughs> You'll learn if you haven't already, when someone says that to you, that's not a question. They're going to tell you their story. So don't, don't even take it as a question. It's just a statement. Here's my story. He said, I can't preach. I'm not a public speaker. But I want to tell you the difference Jesus made in my life. He said, my wife and I had been happily married, and we were able to have a child. And when he was four years old, he he developed leukemia, a very rare terminal case of leukemia. And the doctors, the nurses, they did everything they could. We went to specialists here, specialists there. But when he died in my arms, my own arms, I became so angry at God, so hostile, that I took it out on everyone, including my wife. She left me, and I don't blame her. I was mean. I was just, hatred was filling my heart. He said, I turn to alcohol, drugs, you name it. The same thing everybody else does to self-medicate. He said, I remember going to my favorite watering hole, and I bellied up to the bar, and I started ordering drinks one after another, and I didn't drink, I gulped. And after a while, the bartender, and this is not as, this is not as rare as we think, but the bartender simply said, uh, no, no, I'm not, you don't have another drink. We're going to get someone to help you go home, take you home. I'm not going to let you do that. He goes out and tries to get on his motorcycle. Now, you really have to, it's almost like getting on a horse, really, in a way. You have to be very careful getting on one. You have to know what you're doing. This is from someone who's never ridden one. But the thing fell on him, finally, at about the third try. And he hit his head, kind of awakened him a bit. And he said, I started hearing music. He said, I'm hallucinating. But he said, this bar is kind of off the beaten path. And right across the road was a tent. He said, I've never seen that tent before. And the music I realized was church hymns. I think I'll just go over there and tell them what I think. And he said he opened the tent. And the people could smell him before they saw him. He walked in. And a fine, outstanding African-American preacher with a booming voice like Morgan Freeman-like was preaching away. And when he saw me coming down front, he got to a whisper and he stopped. And I placed my index finger in his face and I said, unless you can tell me why your God let my boy die, you have no right to preach any gospel. I don't know how you'd handle that. I, I could probably be stupefied. How do you handle something like that? Well, listen how he handled it. You could argue with maybe how he handled it, but I, I think it was a pretty, pretty good job. Everybody else in the room left, in a sense, in his mind. They were there, but he, he was focused on this one, one man. And he leaned over to him. He said, sir, I cannot imagine the kind of pain you've experienced and are experiencing. And I want you to know no words I can say can make you feel any better, I don't think. But let me tell you something that I have to say to you. You're making the wrong statements. You're expressing your anger toward God. And I have to ask you a question. Do you want to see your boy again? And he said, I thought, I'd have been asked that question. And he said, like the Pacific Ocean came over me. 
And the next time he said, if you do want to see him, you better get right with God or you'll never see him again. And he said, I felt the gravitational pull to my knees. And I've been exclaiming, oh God, I have been angry. I have sinned against you. I've been mad at you. I've taken everything out on you. I have no right to question you. But Lord, I want to see not only my boy, but I want to see Jesus. I want to be one of your children. And right there, old-fashioned way. Who in the world has tent revivals anymore? But in an old-fashioned way, that man reckoned with God. He said to my friend, he said, Now, I want to remind you, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a public speaker. So anywhere and everywhere you go and you feel led to share that story, would you please do it? Because that was the moment there was an eternal difference made in my life. Now, you and I may not encounter those kind of experiences, but I can tell you this. If he could use those two uneducated, untrained men who only knew how to fish, basically, he can use you as long as you and I exemplify that we have been with Jesus. Jesus.